Uh, the chair of our next session is another of our illustrious graduates, Victoria Young, um, graduated with a PhD in architectural history from Virginia in 03. And she is currently professor of architectural history at um, the University of St. Thomas. Is, did I get that right, the order right? Um, and chair of the department. She's also first vice president of the Society of Architectural Historians and will then advance right to um, soon uh, the presidency of that organization. So we're very fortunate to have you here with us today. Thank you, Sally. This is so fun, isn't it? Oh my gosh, just look at this room. By the way, I hear there's overflow tomorrow, right? Because we're so full. So if you want to sit in this room, get here early. It's a tip of the day. Oh, sorry. Was I supposed to say that? Ugh. Anyway, down front is good. Lots of room open. Um, but I would... I wanted to mention something about the Society of Architectural Historians before I introduce our speakers in our lightning talks. Um, last year at our meeting in Providence, I know some of you were up there to celebrate Richard and given all his work he's done in Newport and he led tours for us in the Providence Annual Conference and he gave a great paper. That room was not standing room only, it was sitting room only. It was jammed. I kept people out for a little bit because of fire code things. But the other thing that happened at that Society of Architectural Historians annual meeting is that Richard was named a fellow of the society. So will you please join me in a wonderful round of applause. <laughs> and it was a lovely night, wasn't it, Richard? It was lovely. All right. So let's meet our first speaker in the lightning talk. So these are about eight to 10 minutes and they're gonna be fast and furious, but fun and fact filled with lots of good information about um, the ways that Mr. Wilson's um, leadership, mentorship has influenced scholars looking at a variety of topics. So our first speaker is Matthew Gallegos. He's a native of Colorado. His professional career has focused on three areas. One third of his adult life as a licensed architect. He practiced architecture with projects in Colorado, New Mexico, Philadelphia, and Alaska. And beginning in 1993, he began teaching architectural history and design studios at Texas Tech, which he did for 15 years. And the remainder of his life, he has either operated or managed his family sheep and cattle ranch. <laughs> which is awesome. I'm a farm girl, that's great. Um, on the Colorado, New Mexico border, which he currently does. So the title of his talk, The Cultures That Produce New Mexico's Premier Re Revival Buildings, please join me in a warm welcome for Matthew. Good afternoon. Richard Guy Wilson told me that Leonard Eaton introduced him to the concept that architecture is the product of cultural values. This presentation studies the cultures that produced New Mexico's premier 19th century medieval revival buildings, St. Francis Cathedral and Loreto Chapel on your left, and the Lourdes Chapel in Okeo Yanque on the right. When New Mexico became a U.S. territory, the Vatican appointed Frenchman Jean-Baptiste Lamy on your left the region's vicar apostolic. In Santa Fe by 1851, two years later, Lamy became Santa Fe's first bishop. Lamy's goal was to regenerate European, European Catholicism in New Mexico, where syncretic Hispanic Native American Catholicism had developed over the previous 250 years. To achieve this end, Lamy recruited from France 31 of the 50 clergy who served in his diocese. The clearest architectural expression of Lamy's goals are the three buildings you saw in the previous image. The city's for, former parish seat, La Parroquia, was Lamy's first cathedral. That's on your right. It loomed over Santa Fe's adobe urban fabric, which Lamy disdained. Of adobe itself, the Parroquia's appearance was a poor symbol of the changes Lamy advocated. Lamy laid his new cathedral's cornerstone in 1869. On your left is the original design. To be of cut stone with the twin-towered facade capped by onion domes, seating 3,000 under 60-foot tall vaults, having a big gabled roof and possessing a transept and crossing dome. Lamy commissioned this design from French architect Antoine Mouly, who previously had worked on restoring the Sainte-Chapelle in Paris. Antoine and his teenage son Projectus were in Santa Fe by 1870. 
Construction progressed sporadically until 1895 due to financing problems and under the direction of several architects. The plan on your right shows the extent of the completion in 1895 with the transept and chancel still that of the Padokia building at the top of that plan. Four years after Antoine Malou arrived in Santa Fe, he returned to France due to progressive blindness. His son Projectus, then 22, remained in charge of the project until he died four years later. Francois Millet, another Frenchman, was then hired to finalize the building's design. He reduced the facade's width, lowered the tower's height, and proposed capping them with wooden spires which were never built. He finalized the entry portico, rose window, and facade towers designs and incorporated the polychromatic Byzantine Romanesque style Lamy favored for economic reasons. One year after his hiring, Mallet was shot dead by Lamy's nephew for having an affair with the nephew's wife. <laughs> Parish clergy and French contractors Millet Machpouf and Quintus Monnier oversaw the work for Mallet's death until work stopped in 1895. Lamy died in 1888, but until 1895, the design and construction consistency were sustained by Italian and French stonemasons Lamy recruited. Principal among them was the Nepalese stonemason Carlo Digneo on your left with his wife and children. By 1883, 25 stonemasons worked on the cathedral, including six from France. Five sandstone colors and two for were used in the cathedral's wall and vault construction. It came from quarries surrounding Santa Fe, and the altar's white marble came from Cerrillos. Originally arriving at the building site via horse-drawn carriages, by the late 1880s, a rail line reached Santa Fe, daily providing two railroad cars of stone. The cathedral's nave colonnade was built outside of the Padoquia's exterior walls over which the new cathedral was built. The Padoquia's flat roof served as scaffolding for constructing the vaults. Archfusoirs were formed of tufa and the vault webbing of pulverized tufa and mixed with calcium hydroxide, pozzolana cement, an ancient Roman invention. The columns, capitals, and cornices were of galvanized metal shipped from St. Louis. The voussoirs were connected to the column shafts prior to the capital's attachment. When the vaulting was completed, the parochia's adobe walls and wooden beams were removed through the front door. Twelve stained glass windows from France were installed in 1885, the year Lamy resigned as Santa Fe's archbishop, three years prior to his death. In 1895, all work stopped and the cathedral was consecrated with the adobe transept and chancel remaining. That top image you can see at the back end of it, there's these shorter mud-looking buildings uh, on the building. Uh, construction resumed in 1966 when the adobe transept and chancel were destroyed along with late Lamy's marble altar. An architect Urban Widener skylit chancel was constructed. That's what's shown on the bottom image on the right. The Spanish colonial revival Reredos on your left was installed in 1985. The design of the Loreto Chapel on your right and the Lourdes Chapel on the left are evocations of Paris Saint-Chapelle, which Lamy held in high regard. Under Lamy's supervision, Projectus took over the Loreto Chapel project in 1874 and completed it in 1878, the year he died of pneumonia at the age of 26. San Juan's Lourdes Chapel was built 10 years after both the Muleys and Lamy were deceased. In the Loreto and Lourdes Chapel designs, the San Chapelle's exterior formal elements emulated were verticality, rows and gable windows, bar tracery, buttress pinnacles, and a flesh tower. Interior elements emulated were quatrefoil ribbed vaulting and blue star encrusted vault webbing. Each chapel possesses some of these elements. Both have vertical massing. Loreto has a rose and pediment windows and bar tracery. Lourdes Chapel's Gothic entry arch replaces San Chapelle's rose and pediment window with two statues, trefoil windows, and a lancet pediment window. Built to serve Loreto's Girls Academy on your left, the, the Loreto Chapel's exterior has shallow pier buttresses, pinnacles, and a flesh. Loreto's interior like Lamy's Cathedral, has transfers, arches, and simple webbing on your left. And on your right, Loretto's Chapel's most famed design element is a spiral wooden staircase which has two complete turns, no central column, and is joined entirely by wooden pegs. Omitted in the original design, it was designed and built four, four years after Projectus' death by an itinerant carpenter folklore identifies as having been St. Joseph. 
the New Mexico State Historic Preservation Division in 1999 identified that Digneo on your on your right, who worked on the Cathedral in Loretto Chapel, was involved in building the Lord's Chapel. On your left is a photograph of the chapel's 1890 dedication. This chapel belonged to San Juan Parish, located on the eastern bank of the Rio Grande on the Oque Oyenque Reservation. This is the oldest Christos Christian congregation in the United States, established in 1598 by the region's first permanent Spanish settlers, nine years before the settlement of Jamestown, Virginia. The Spanish named the parish an existing pueblo, San Juan de los Caballeros, meaning St. John of the Gentleman, due to the kind reception the settlers received. The first Spanish colonial saddle, settlement, Chamita, was across the river from the pueblo. Father Camilo Su, one of the French clergy Lamy recruited, was the parish's pastor for 54 years. Unlike Lamy and most of his clerical recruits, Father Sue came of a family of substantial means. He paid for the statue of Our Lady of Lourdes he imported from France and erected in 1888, which is what's shown on the right. Uh, when the statue's presence resulted in public displays of devotion by the Pueblo's residents and others, Father Sue proposed and financed the Lord's Chapel's construction. Working with Digneo and the labor and skills of the San Juan Parish community, Father Sue oversaw the construction. Unlike the Cathedral of Loretto's ketstone facades, the Lord's Chapel's walls, voussoirs, and vault webbing are all made of tufa, transported from Chamita by train from a quarry on the Colorado-New Mexico border. The parish members shape the stone into ashlar blocks of irregular length but uniform height. This material even formed the chapel's eaves, which you can see on the right. Uh, I've never seen another building that has stone eaves. Uh, the chapel's facade organization is two squares, uh, the diagonals of which define the height of the entry door, the framing arch, and the location of the pediment's lancet windows. The structure for the choir loft staircase is provided, and the building's corners and side walls are all buttressed. The nave's length is also two squares, which is on, shown on the right. On le your left is shown that the two square bays are divided into three quatrefoil ribbed vault bays. The, ch the chapel has crystal chandeliers and a blue filled with gold stars on the vault webbing. Trompe-l'oeil fabric covers the chapel's walls. These windows were also imported from France. This section, oh, there's the windows. Uh, this section reveals the ubiquitous use of tufa in the chapel's construction and the placement of adobe above the vaults to lock them in place. In conclusion, the architectural culture Ar Archbishop Lamy attempted to impose on Santa Fe's Catholics was never accepted. With Lamy's death, the desire to complete the cathedral waned and subsequent design work disregarded his design ambitions. In contrast, the patrons of the Loretto Chapel, the Loretto Sisters, accepted Lamy's aesthetic values. Yet, while successful in completing their structure's original design, the chapel is best known for the staircase that resulted from the original designer's omission. The Lord's Chapel does not have the Santa Fe building's refined exterior formal elements and materials, yet of the three, it has one of the most signature French Gothic formal elements, quadripartite ribbed vaulting. Father Sue's years of service to the parish during which he introduced European formal elements such as European religious art made this fidelity to the French Gothic aesthetic possible. Under Digneo's direction, the chapel was quickly and carefully crafted by the parish community, who eschewed using measuring devices or modern tools. They emulated European technology using only one material, the tufa, and secured it in place with their own vernacular material, adobe, which Lamy despised. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Our next speaker is Molly Lester. Molly is a research associate for Penn Praxis, the applied practice arm of the Stuart Weitzman School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. She's a project manager for research, documentation, and community engagement projects related to historic buildings and cultural landscapes. In addition to her role with Penn Praxis, Molly is a 2019 fellow for the James Marston Fitch Foundation, leading an independent research and media project exploring the career of architect Minerva Parker Nichols, who you're all going to become familiar with. She holds a Master's of Science in Historic Preservation from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of Architectural History from the University of Virginia. Please welcome Molly. It's 
really lovely and surreal to be back. <laughs> All right, I want to start at the end. In 1949, when Minerva Parker Nichols died and the New York Times ran a full headlined obituary to memorialize her. If you've been following the Times current Overlooked No More series, which honors the many significant women who were never mentioned in their obituary pages, then the fact that Minerva got this coverage should spark your curiosity. Welcome to the last eight years of my life. <laughs> I first found mention of Minerva in 2011 when I was in search of a thesis topic for my master's program. In four years of undergrad classes here at UVA and two years of graduate coursework, I'd never come across any discussion of her and few other women for that matter. Yet here I was looking at a list of nearly 60 buildings that wouldn't have existed were it not for this woman including houses, an iron foundry, women's clubs, and a pavilion for the World's Columbian Exposition. I was reading full front page feature profiles of her in trade publications that had barely showcased any architects before, let alone female ones. Essentially, I was learning for the first time in 2011 what plenty of people already knew back in the 1890s, that Minerva Parker Nichols was the first woman in the country to practice architecture independently without a man attached to her firm, and that in a pre-suffrage era that saw architecture professionalizing itself away from the building trades, she bridged both of those worlds, supervising all her own construction projects and carving out a nationally renowned architecture career based on sheer competence, savvy, and women-funded commissions. I'm guessing most of you haven't heard of her before today either, so let me tell you about her. Minerva Parker was born in Illinois in 1862. When she was just 14 months old, her father died fighting for the Union Army. The loss of her father and the burdens placed on her widowed mother thrust Minerva into close contact with her grandfather, who lived nearby and taught a young Minerva about drawing and building structures. In 1876, Minerva's family moved to Philadelphia. While her widowed mother opened a boarding house, Minerva enrolled in every trade program she could find, seeking a future income for herself and her family. It was a new era rife with possibilities for women to train in the applied arts, and Philadelphia was especially teeming with these institutions, many of which Minerva attended. She graduated from one program with a special distinction for her, quote, commendable zeal and ability, and landed soon after in the office of architect Edwin W. Thorne, who was busy with a slew of residential commissions in the developing suburbs along the main line of the Pennsylvania Railroad, just outside of Philadelphia. In 1888, Edwin decided to move his office a few blocks away, and Minerva seized the opportunity to take over his existing office. While Louise Blanchard is generally considered the first American woman to open an architectural practice, based on the office she opened with Robert Bethune in 1881, Minerva was the first to do so on her own. I'm not interested in pitting Minerva against Louise <laughs> or their later contemporaries for these superlatives. Any desire to do so says a lot less about the women in question and a lot more about how we limit the space for women in our histories. However, it is worth offering Louise's career as context for Minerva's, as we consider the ways in which Minerva's obstacles to, to a successful career were different from Louise's. Without a male partner, Minerva had to create a business model where none existed, forging for herself a willing clientele and a profitable portfolio in a field and an era that primarily equipped men with the education, training, promotion, and professional networks to achieve success. With only half of those assets in hand, Minerva hung her own shingle at the age of 26, choosing to build her own solo practice centered on women and the places that they created for themselves. Within the first two years alone, Minerva published 11 notices of active projects in her office. She earned praise early and often for her capabilities in supervising construction for these commissions. Tradespeople commented on it, journalists praised her for it, and Minerva pointed to it as the key for her success. Quote, I don't mind walking over scaffolding a bit, she told one newspaper, but I draw the line on ladders. <laughs> over the course of her career, Minerva designed over 60 projects around the country, at least half of which were residential commissions for women clients in particular. It must be noted that we're talking about middle and upper class women and that there's no evidence to date that she worked with any clients of color. Minerva equated this choice to specialize in a typology with a doctor's decision to claim a specialization within medicine. Indeed for her, this specialization was the clearest path to success as an architect. 
with true impact on Americans, and in particular women's, domestic lives and the American built environment. If Professor Wilson's work has taught us anything, it's that residential air architecture carries as much design significance as institutional works, and Minerva established, propelled, and sustained her career by specializing in these projects. She also wrote a series of articles in women's publications that brought her readers into the fold of contemporary architectural discourse and massively increased her audience of potential clients. The association between a female architect and residential architecture cannot be separated from the 19th century's notions of domestic science, gender essentialism, and cultural tastes through the work of Catherine Beecher and others. But we should not overinterpret those social contexts in our reading of Minerva's career and success. Rather, we need to consider the combination of her practical training, her confidence and competence, and the network of professional women that she landed among and built up. For example, one of her earliest solo projects was a house for Rachel Foster Avery, the protege of Susan B. Anthony. Rachel was a member of the New Century Club of Philadelphia, which hired Minerva to build its clubhouse in 1891. Around that same time, the Queen Isabella Association hired Minerva to design a large pavilion for the World's Columbian Exposition. In a saga of politicking, that project was never actually built, but her network continued to grow nevertheless in part because of a lot of publicity around that commission. For these women and others, Minerva's architecture incorporated the most modern conveniences and made explicit mention of the best living conditions for children. In doing so, her work aimed to make her clients' lives easier and their children's lives better. The years from 1889 to 1896 were the busiest of Minerva's career, before she married, had four children, and moved to Brooklyn with her family. Once she left Philadelphia, she never maintained a full-fledged practice again, but she continued to design for friends and family until later in life, before dying in 1949 at the age of 87. Still, having told you previously that 1949 was the end of this story, I need to breeze past that date and question what's happened to Minerva's story and significance in the 70 years since her death. Why have we, as architectural historians, left her out of our histories? What does that say about how we evaluate significance? of the building, of the designer, of the client, and how much credence we give to the women and to other underrepresented communities at the margins. How much of our narrative and how many of our artists have we lost or outright omitted? The only architectural history books that mention Minerva are the same ones where we sideline all of our early women architects rather, rather than situating any of them within our general scholarship, or most of them. This marginalization belies the fact that in her day, she was frequently mentioned with deferential respect by architects and builders alike. For how many of our other firmly established architects could that be said? After the World's Columbian Exposition had concluded, one newspaper sought Minerva out for her opinion of the fair, featuring her right alongside, and even above, the reflections of her peers, Frank Furness, Wilson Eyre, and others in Philadelphia. The story of Minerva Parker Nichols' career and a lot of women's careers, is a story of gatekeeping. First, in terms of her access to the practice of architecture, and second, in terms of her acknowledgement in the history of architecture. Her success in getting through the first gate depended on her education, expertise, and persistence. Getting her through the second gate depends on ours. Thanks. Thank you, Molly. All right, our next speaker is Will Knup, who attended UVA for his bachelor's in architectural history, getting that in 2012, and his master's in 2015, during which time he had the pleasure of having RGW as his academic advisor and thesis advisor. Will currently lives in Brooklyn and works as a facade restoration consultant for surface design. He also serves on the board of the New York chapter of the Victorian Society and is an alum of the Newport, Chicago, and London summer schools, the trifecta. <laughs> Nicely done. Um, his talk today, Public Safety and Preservation, New York City's FISP, FISP Law, and its effect on historic fabric. Please join me in welcoming Will. When I came to UVA in 2008, 
As an undeclared first year in the Col College of Arts and Sciences, I had no idea that architectural history was a field of study that one could pursue. Thankfully, at the end of my first year, knowing nothing about his stature in the department, I stumbled into RGW's office, where he kindly explained that if I liked historic buildings, I would fit right in with the rest of the weirdos in the department. <laughs> Six years later, after taking every course taught by Professor Wilson I could fit in my schedule, and working with him as my undergraduate and graduate thesis advisor, I was a confirmed Jefferson file and a column hugger. The day after defending my master's thesis, I got an email from an architecture firm in New York that specializes in facade restoration and exterior envelope consulting. I'd never heard of such a thing before and had no idea that such a niche existed within the, the, world, or the um, profession of architecture. In New York City, however, facade inspection and repair is a fairly sizable industry thanks to legislation known as Local Law 11 or the Facade Inspection Safety Program. The origins of this legislation are tragic. On May 16, 1979, Grace Gold, an 18-year-old freshman at Barnard College, was fatally struck by a piece of terracotta that fell from an 11-story building at Broadway and West 115th. The building from which the masonry fell had not been adequately maintained, which led to the deterioration of the decorative facade elements. As a result of this incident, in 1980, Mayor Ed Koch signed Local Law 10, the first piece of legislation that required building owners in New York City to regularly inspect and perform necessary repairs on the exteriors of their buildings. Forty years later, New York City has implemented even stricter protections under the current Facade Inspection Safety Program, or FISP, which requires that all buildings above six stories have their facades inspected every five years. As a facade restoration consultant, uh, as a facade restoration consultant, I perform these critical safety inspections. Uh, sorry, I lost my place. I perform these critical safety inspections. Working from a suspended scaffold, a window washing rig, or sometimes ropes, I document any necessary problem. Any, <laughs> I document any masonry problems I find. I draft the necessary construction documents to carry out the restoration, and then inspect the execution of the repairs to make sure that the buildings will be considered safe. One of the materials we pay particular attention to is architectural terracotta. Now, prior to starting my job as a facade inspector, I'd had some exposure to terracotta from courses like Professor Wilson's 19th Century American. Uh, I'd also studied terracotta during the Victorian Society London Summer School. I've now had the pleasure, as, as you pointed out, of, uh, of attending all three summer schools. And if I could make a quick plug for them, they're all fantastic programs. And if you attend any of them, either uh, in uh, London, Chicago, or Newport, you'll undoubtedly see some fabulous examples of architectural terracotta. For example, if you go to the Chicago Summer School, you'll have the opportunity to visit the Rookery, where you might have a chance to get an exclusive tour of the offices of Burnham and Root. Or if you go to the Newport Summer School, which is now in its 32nd year with Professor Wilson as its course director, you'll have the opportunity to visit McKimbead and White's Rosecliff Mansion with Richard. And I have to say, I have a particular fondness for the Newport Summer School because it's where I met my fiance. So Richard, I'm thankful to you for more than my education. <laughs> anyway, back to facades in New York. The current FISP legislation is undoubtedly important from a public safety standpoint. However, having worked in the field for four years now, it's been interesting to observe some of the effects it's had on the historic fabric of New York. I'd like to share a few case studies that show the various effects that the facade inspection laws might have on historic preservation. FISP is generally a boon for landmark structures because it requires building owners to perform regular preventative maintenance. However, when faced with the cost of restoring non-landmark buildings, many owners decide to comply with safety regulations by stripping terracotta and other embellishments rather than repairing them. While making the streets safer, FISP regulation has un had had has had unintended effects on the architectural character of New York City, particularly with regard to the underappreciated buildings that define its streetscapes. On landmark buildings, the FIST program works well with the protections that NYC's landmark system offers. If repairs are required to make the building safe, then all parts of that exterior work must be reviewed and approved by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. Bricks, mortar, and replacement terracotta units all need to be vetted by their preservationists to ensure they match the historic color and texture of the buildings. At the Knickerbocker Hotel, we found several terrifying cracks running through some of the terracotta modillions on the ninth floor. 
These precarious pieces weighed a little over 90 pounds apiece and were dangling over the heads of hundreds of pedestrians below in Times Square. Since these were isolated units, the LPC approved a replacement with glass fiber reinforced concrete colored and painted to match the color of the original terracotta glaze. So the end result was that the building maintained all of its historic profiles and was made safe for the public below. For buildings that aren't landmarked, however, the FIST program can sometimes have negative effects on the preservation of historic building materials. In May of 2015, another tragedy occurred on the Upper West Side. A two-year-old girl was killed by a piece of terracotta that fell from a building which had been inspected four years earlier through the FIST program and declared safe. This incident led the DOB to reconsider the parameters of the FIST program and has made getting approval for terracotta repairs such as pinning and patching more difficult. This effectively promotes the replacement of whole terracotta units, and this approach is at odds with the Secretary of Interior standards, which promotes stabilization in place as a first option and uh, replacement in kind only as a secondary measure. I'm currently working on a project in Brooklyn, which is just outside the Park Slope Historic District and is therefore not subject to LPC review. It has a significant amount of cracked terracotta on the facade. Because of the new DOB strictures, in some areas on the facade, despite my firm's recommendations, the owner has decided to remove some of the deteriorated terracotta and replace it with brick. Luckily, at the locations where terracotta is going to be removed, there are adjacent units that will remain that can be used to replicate the original profiles if at some point in the future the owners have a bit more money and decide they want to restore it back to its 1920s appearance. So for example, in this slide, the, the flat ones that are above the, the window head those ones will be replaced with brick, which is unfortunate. Um, we're doing our best to try and get a good match. Um, but hopefully at some point in the future, uh, when they have an owner that isn't out of money, it'll be restored to its original appearance. In some cases, the effects can be even more drastic, especially on what one might consider, or one, 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 what one might call background buildings. That is, buildings that aren't landmarked, don't have dramatic decorative profiles, or perhaps are more industrial in character. In spite of more humble appearances, these buildings are a vital part of the character of local neighborhoods and the city as a whole. One example of this is in Long Island City, Queens. The Sunshine Biscuit Building was built in, in 1912 and became known as the Thousand Window Bakery. When it was built, it was the largest bakery building in the world and held that title until 1955. All nine, story of it, all nine stories of its exterior were clad in white terracotta. Due to a lack of maintenance, that terracotta deteriorated, and in 2014, when faced with the prospect of extensive repairs, the owner opted instead to rip it all off. A reclad in metal panels is currently underway. In conclusion, while the NYC facade inspection program is not perfect, there's a lot of good preservation work that's being done under this system. No one doubts the importance of the program from a public safety standpoint, but I believe that New York needs to re-examine re the current implementation of the FIST program so that savable elements are not stripped unnecessarily. Overall, though, I'm delighted to be working in this, in this industry because it enables me to put my research skills that I learned from Professor Wilson to use, and I really enjoy the balance of time in the office and time hanging off the sides of buildings. Oh my gosh, and no fear of heights either, right, Will? God darn it. All right, our next speaker is Andrew Marshall, who is a registered architect specializing in historic preservation with Cunningham Quill Architects in Washington, D.C. Um, Mr. Marshall is also a 2018 graduate of the Architectural History Program. The paper he'll be presenting today stems from his research on the post-World War II architecture of public administration in Virginia's small communities with the great title, after all, it's the welfare office and nobody likes us. The History of Architecture of Public Welfare in Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Andrew. All right. Uh, so initially, I'd hoped to include this uh, uh, as a chapter in the master's thesis. And um, very, when I had a very early on talk with Richard about the topics that I was looking at, he said, it's already too damn big. <laughs> so... Anyway, here we are. Uh, 
As noted in my talk today, I will survey the history of buildings used for public welfare in Virginia. This is an architectural history of our most maligned public service. Welfare efforts began to formalize at the state level in the early 20th century. This shift would come to end the tradition of the almshouse, which had long relied on local funding to collectively house and care for the poor, indigent, disabled, aged, and abandoned in a practice known as indoor relief. The county almshouse in many communities had come to be typified by a wood frame farmhouse staffed solely by a married couple. As the reputation of the almshouse model fell into disrepute, Virginia's welfare director, Arthur W. James, called the, co the county almshouse, quote, the leading example of inefficient, inhuman, unprogressive, unscientific government. In turn, state officials invented its replacement the district home, as a modern device to achieve their goals. However, only a handful of these were ever constructed. The New Deal policies of the 1930s instead reoriented public welfare towards outdoor relief. This transformation ended the inpatient model of indoor relief in favor of the issuance of benefits as monies or commodities via local departments. The Virginia Public Welfare and Assistance Act of 1938 required each county to establish a welfare department in order to provide relief for old age assistance, aid to dependent children, aid to the blind, in addition to foster care and general relief programs. This new outdoor relief also demanded less architecture. The welfare departments consisted of reception areas, private interview rooms, staff offices, and storage spaces. And their scale was driven by the number of employees. These local units were funded via taxation at federal, state, and local levels. The programs were attacked by conservative politicians as socialistic efforts that undermine the American work ethic and social fabric, including absurd claims that welfare was, quote, subsidizing the birth of illegitimate children. Not until after increased federal regulations of the 1962 welfare amendments did all local governments in Virginia come to employ a welfare superintendent as well as social workers, eligibility technicians, and administrative workers. In neighboring North Carolina, the first purpose-built public welfare buildings were constructed in the 1960s. Virginia did not follow North Carolina's lead. Our state remained miserly toward welfare and avoided providing any incentives for its offices. No federal inducements existed either. Rather, the post-war post architecture of welfare in Virginia is one of adaptive reuse. Counties repurposed existing office spaces or leased buildings, undertaking small renovation projects for new welfare offices. Caroline County placed their department in the old Bowling Green Hotel. Goochland renovated its old, its old clerk's offices while Middlesex used its defunct jail. These projects mirrored recommendations from an earlier California state design manual for local welfare offices, which I was amazed existed, to be honest, um, which suggested that architects and officials avoid elaborate or luxurious quarters. Accordingly, Virginian offices and architects provided functional and economic offices that often seemed hidden away, according to one welfare rights activist. In 1973, new regulatory standards modernized welfare offices. The requirements included greater services and access, along with mandates of square footage minimums for each staff position. A Greene County supervisor and noted welfare antagonist summarized the impact of such federal and state regulations at the local level. The government will put in a program and say it won't cost the county anything. First thing you know, the county finds itself having to hire more and more help and provide more and more space to accommodate the program. This gripe was correct. These new regulations created the need for welfare buildings. Two local examples will help illustrate this change. In 1968, Isle of Wight County relocated its welfare department into an early 20th century wood frame store building. Its subsequent condemnation moved the department into surplus modular classrooms. Next, it was placed in an unused courtroom then the staff returned to the condemned store, which soon caught fire with the department's records inside. Next, the old Smithfield High School, seven miles away, was used for its offices. Throughout this itinerant period, county officials consistently failed to demonstrate progress 
toward compliant quarters despite numerous state deadlines. Finally, in 1983, the county commissioned the first new building in post-World War II Virginia with the local welfare department as, it, as its principal tenant. Isle of Wight County supervisors saw the building as part of the courthouse complex and pushed for colonial revival styling to contend with this pre-existing context. Such deference was common for the new public building types of the period, but this, with its recessed arcaded entrance and end gables on the principal facade, was a rather elaborate welfare building. Meanwhile, in Cumberland County, the converted welfare building lacked potable water service and an accessible entrance. The ramp was added later. <laughs> Nor did it meet square footage requirements. Officials debated how to create new quarters for its department without political reprisal. Counties across Virginia considered four strategies. One, request municipal bonds via public vote. Unpopular approach. <laughs> Two, include the offices in a consolidated county office building. Three, apply for federal housing and urban development grants. Or four, use its federal grants to pay for a lease of a privately constructed and, and owned building. Cumberland officials selected the least option. In 1984, Cumberland officials commissioned a 2,400 square foot building sited directly behind the current previous welfare office, a short drive from the courthouse. This economical structure was the first building constructed for and dedicated solely to a local welfare department in the state of Virginia. And it's, I, if this is not the most mundane building shown this weekend, I'll give somebody $5. Um, tan and brown brick veneer clad its principal facade with painted concrete block on the balance of the building. Luan plywood paneling lined the interior walls with a ceiling finish of acoustical tile. In conclusion, the formalized welfare program of post-war Virginia was shaped by a tug of war between federal and state expansion and local hostility and economy. Local officials sought to limit the visibility of welfare when they no longer possessed the power to limit its existence. Consequently, the quarters for local welfare departments became a specter of local government. Yet as these programs persisted, they produced an architecture of flexibility and utility. And although the state welfare director declared in 1960 that public welfare programs exist, quote, because they are the will of the people, their nature ultimately was driven by the imposition of federal and state regulations on local governments. Ultimately, the beauty of welfare lies in its empathic and substantive goal to improve the lives of its recipients. But such beauty is not extended to these economic buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And our final speaker in the lightning talks is Bill Richards, who is a writer based in Washington, D.C., and author of Revolt and Reform in Architecture's Academy, Urban Renewal, Race, and the Rise of Design in the Public Interest from Rutledge in 2017, as well as the forthcoming Living in Nature, Bamboo Houses, and Design to be published by Princeton Architectural Press. His work has appeared in Architect, Architectural Record, and Landscape Architecture Magazine, among other publications. And from 2007 to 2011, Bill was the editor-in-chief of Inform Magazine, published by the Virginia AIA. And from 2011 to 19, he was the Senior Director of Digital Content Strategy for AIA National. He is currently the Director of Communications for Economic Studies at the Brookings, Brookings Institution, a nonpartisan think tank. Title of his talk, Wilsonian Trends in Retirement Security. Please join me in welcoming Bill. I was delighted that um, <clears throat> Warnicke made uh, an appearance today. He is my 147th favorite architect. <laughs> and it's so hard to keep track of someone like Warnicke. Yeah, I know. I've been working on that for like 30 seconds. Uh, here we go. So I wasn't sure what today was going to be about. You know, if, if, if the call was really for a... Um, you know, a very polite academic talk, or if this was going to be a roast 
of some kind. <laughs> so when confronted with a, a challenging question, I, I sort of always uh, don't answer it. So I just didn't answer it um, and did something else entirely. So Wilsonian Trends in Retirement Security, that is the title of this talk. Although there are others named Wilson who might be on trend, we are concerned today with the Richard Guy variety who retired this May after 47 years. Now, uh, I'm not really that good at math, but I did some multiplying, and that is averaging 200 students per semester times two semesters per year times 47 years, that's about 18,800 students. Wow. Yeah, I know. As well as, yes? <laughs> as well as 112 Volvos, 85 bow ties. <laughs> 47 round-trip drives to New Hampshire and a remarkable 519 dogs with strange names. <laughs> but, but here's a real number. 10,000 Americans each day retire, according to Census Bureau figures. And on this day, or on, on, on one day this past May, when Richard retired with 9,999 others, uh, they joined another trend that continues to break historical models, according to the Census Bureau. By 2030, Richard's broader cohort of retirees will outnumber children in the United States. And that's actually true. That's no joke. And fiber supplements will outnumber <laughs> Freibel blocks. So, now economically speaking, the senior discount at Dunkin' Donuts and Applebee's that Richard and others enjoy currently uh, will likely put these re restaurants out of business unless something drastic happens. <laughs> now, we're here to talk about architecture, and I think architecture offers a different story um, and maybe a guidepost for retirees. Yes, the number of working Americans over the age of 65 has never been greater, but architects have always worked well past the point when most mortals give up and spend their days golfing. Frank Lloyd Wright worked another 28 years beyond Social Security's early retirement age. Gropius, another 21 years be, uh, beyond that so-called retirement age. Uh, Mies worked another 18 years. Thomas Jefferson, another 18 years. And William Rutherford Mead, the Shemp to his more famous partners, another 16 years. <laughs> and architectural historians, architectural historians must hang in there even longer if they're going to have the final word. So by this standard, by this standard, Richard is completely on trend in retirement, uh, fighting the good fight long after the wimpier historians have unplugged their slide machines. Uh, so did Richard have the final word? Um, what, in fact, were his words over the years? And uh, do they offer clues about his legacy? In a 2017 interview for Antiques and Arts Weekly, uh, Richard reflected on his own evolving tastes by noting, I haven't learned to hate anything, but there are more and more things one looks at. <laughs> The more Richard looks, the more questions he tends to raise about the most vexing issues of our shared heritage. For instance, we all know that the quality of the answer depends on the quality of the question. Um, in a 2006 book introduction, Richard's inquiry-based method appeared as a Gatling gun assault on readers, and I just wanted to share that with you. What does colonial revival mean? Which colonial past and whose? And what is colonial? Is the colonial revival a movement? When did it start? What is the first building? Who supported the colonial revival? Uh, how did it develop in the United States? How popular was the colonial revival? I mean, the questions go on and on. And sometimes these lines of inquiry are fuzzier and more mysterious. And sometimes he asks us to take a leap with him. He asks us to, in fact, trust him. In a 2013, uh, speaking about William and Mary, uh, circa 1760, during Jefferson's time, Richard paints a picture of the Wren Pile by saying, Descriptions of life there are like Animal House or like Rugby Road on a Friday night. <laughs> Think of this. One big building, everybody crammed in there, nothing across the street, get where I'm going. <laughs> Richard comes and goes a lot. He's always going somewhere. Uh, and once he left town and asked me to pinch hit for him and lead a tour of the lawn for what he called the Blue Hairs um, <laughs> during a reunion weekend, and he said, uh, well, you know what to do, uh, he said like this, and I mean, you've been to my lectures, at least I think you've been. <laughs> and then he ended with, anyway, there's 15 bucks in it for you. <laughs> So 
So going back to the title of the talk, we've, we've covered some Wilsonian trends, but what about retirement security? And by retirement security, I, I don't mean expense to fixed income ratio. I don't mean infirmities or rising health care costs. I don't even mean reverse mortgages, second mortgages, or annuities. Um, what I mean is the central paradox uh, of retirement. To retire is to retreat, to withdraw, to decamp, and to adjourn from a job. But it is not a retreat from the things you've stood for. Um, it is not a retreat from yourself. And in Richard's case, uh, I think what he stands for and his impact on everyone in this room is evident in this weekend's presentations. Uh, by retirement security, I mean the security in knowing that Richard's legacy is evident in this room and multiplied by many thousands of people who have seen architecture through his eyes. Uh, the security is the teleology of life becoming a continuum of living. And in that continuum, the landscape of Richard's retirement is not about withdrawing, decamping, adjourning, but rather the obvious prosperity inherited by several generations of students and colleagues. So you might be wondering, where's the architecture? Uh, as Richard would say, as he always said to me, because I didn't really use it that much. Uh, <laughs> I've shown you almost no buildings whatsoever. And, 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 and if buildings are evidence, then it's clear I have no evidence. Um, <laughs> but it's not necessarily about the architecture, but what you make of the architecture and uh, what it points to. On the occasion of your retirement, uh, we owe you all owe you a, a gratitude for making a whole lot of, out of architecture, um, for sharing the buildings you've loved or hated, and for making architecture mean something so that we may make something of it. So thank you, Richard. seems like a lot to do. I have a very simple question, really, for Matthew. Uh, do you know who the uh, stained glass maker is? For Because I have my suspicions. My presentation started out 15 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> and in those 15 pages, I have the name of the... Uh, I, I don't remember. Is it Lorraine? Pardon? Is it Lorraine? Because no. it's a French maker. Okay. No. All right. Yes. Yeah. And all these pictures are all the windows came from the same studio. Okay. I'll get you later, Max. I'm just interested. Thank you. What was the Queen Isabella Society, and what were they going to do in that really big building? Yeah, so the Queen Isabella Association was formed in the years leading up to the World's Columbian Exposition by a group of women who said it wasn't just the King Ferdinand in Spain who sent Columbus here, it was Queen Isabella, and they wanted to honor her. Um, and I can give you a really quick compression of why that building get, didn't get built. Um, it was supposed to be a huge pavilion, as you saw, um, it was going to have accommodations for women coming to the fair and hospital space and any number of things you could think of as services to accommodate women traveling alone or in groups. Um, but there was a competing effort to get the women's building at the fair, and um, the board of lady managers outmaneuvered the Queen Isabella Association and basically got the fairs committee to determine that I mean, I'm shorthanding, but that only one could get built and the other would have to be outside the fairgrounds. So they ended up building a smaller pavilion, so they ditched Minerva's design in order to kind of scale down for outside the fairgrounds. Well, did it get built, the small one? The small one did, yeah. Was it near the fairgrounds? I don't know exactly where. I just know it had to be outside the gates. Was the queen who designed the small one? No, they... they dispatched with her. Her design was inspired by the Alhambra. She sent away for plans for, for it, but once they, once they had to scale down, they kind of scaled down in all senses. Uh, 
I have a question for William. Uh, the um, the FISP law, um, given its unintended consequences, is there any talk at all about revising that law? Uh, and what resources does the city make available to these um, property owners, if any, to help defray the cost of uh, maintaining these uh, facades? It's a good question. Um, in terms of revising it, I, I think that um, the problem is that there aren't enough inspections, which is part of why um, the tragedy that occurred in 2015 happened was because currently the legislation only requires that a um, roof to, to sidewalk level inspection be, um, be conducted only at, at one portion of the building. And I think it should really be all facades, especially those that face the street. Um, and if there were uh, more um, thorough inspections, then that would eliminate the problems. But currently, especially because for the, the two incidents I mentioned, uh, it was terracotta that's become kind of the, the villain for the Department of Building. And it's really not, uh, it's, it's a great building material. Like it, it, it'll last 100 years or more um, if, you, if you allow it. Um, and really, any building material you put on a building for a century or more has the potential to fall off. And in terms of uh, funding that's available in New York City, um, there's nothing that's from the city. Hi, uh, my question was for Andrew. Um, do you have any sense how Virginia fares in the uh, national scene in terms of how it treats um, or has accepted the notion of uh, providing welfare? It was generally historically low. The Deep South was more miserly, as I put it during mm -hmm. the talk, but it was uh, sort of middle of the pack for the South. Um, obviously, states like California, other places led the way, but I was rather surprised to see the state incentives which produced that North Carolina those North Carolina welfare mm -hmm. buildings. That one was actually the one that I showed, which is a pretty pretty plain building, was actually highlighted as an excellent example of great design by the local newspaper. So um, quite low. Um, are, are these buildings where people, recipients, need to come, or it's simply where staff are dispatched or keeping records? It's where recipients would come. So it would, be it would actually be both of those. So they would be public-facing. It's, you know, the welfare department is one of the two service departments of this sort of post-New Deal government expansion with the health department being the other two. So those are rather unique within the local government, the county government or city government, um, where they'd actually have a, a sort of a public face to them that they would actually receive people. So it would be both. And then commodity distribution tended to be separate in sort of warehouses placed in wherever they could kind of cram them. But... It, it varied. Some states, some counties jumped on providing food stamps when they were enacted in the early 70s. Others fought against it and said, no, we're providing commodities, seeing it as sort of a restraint mm -hmm. against sort of, I and guess, those. profligate spending, I guess you could say. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm wondering, has anybody figured out the system of proportions in Richard's famous bow ties? <laughs> I, I think personally they are based on Palladio's harmonic system of proportions. It just depends on... <clears throat> How tight I tie them. <laughs> Too tight, and I don't speak. So, <laughs> all right. Join me in thanking our speakers for an excellent panel. All right, everyone, back in this room, sitting down, ready to go by five minutes after five to hear Mr. Wilson provide remarks. <laughs>